Our next speaker is Hailan Huang. He's an assistant professor in the Analytical and Translational Genetic Unit at, at Mass General. He's also an associate member at the Broad uh, and is also a professor in the Department of Medicine at Harvard Medical School. Highlands Lab um, develops and applies cutting edge statistical genetics and computational techniques to understand genetic architecture of, human, of complex human disorders, um, especially in the areas of autoimmune and psychiatric uh, disease. Today, Highland joins us and will share why, the, uh, why it's important to use globally representative data sets and in the absence of, of those, um, uh, what statistical methods, statistical and analytical methods one can um, uh, um, create to, to have more precise and inclusive uh, models of understanding human health and disease. He, uh, Hai Liang is also joining us from Italy. Um, similar, he's at the same conference that uh, that Lori um, is attending. And so I really appreciate you taking the extra effort to, to join us um, from abroad. Thanks, Hai Liang. I, uh, I'll pass it over to you for your talk. No problem. Well, thank you so much for the introduction and for inviting me to be here for this uh, important discussion. Uh, it's certainly a great pleasure to be here. Um, in the next 15 minutes, I'm going to share with you my thoughts in globally representative data sets and the emerging methods to analyze them. So uh, first, why it is important to have a globally representative data set? So here's my favorite example. In a study in 2013, a haplotype of five SNPs in the gene SLC39A11 was reported to be associated to type 2 diabetes. But this, was, this association was only observed in the East Asian and Mexican population, but not in the European and African population. And to be clear, the reason for this is not because the biology is different, it's simply because uh, this haplotype is more frequent in the East Asian and the Mexican population. The frequency is 12% for East Asian and 20 28 percent uh, for the Mexican population, while it's only two percent in the European, less than two percent in European African population. So, if we did not do this uh, analysis outside of the European population, we wouldn't be able to know this association. So, despite of this clear importance of including all ancestral population in genetic study, uh, unfortunately, the genetic study is severely underrepresented. Uh, for the non-European population. So this is a figure taken from Alicia Martin's uh, 2019 paper. As you can see, even very recently in 2018, the uh, genetic data set is predominantly uh, by, uh, by, the non, by, by the white European population. Uh, and the non-European population is only a small proportion of the total number of individuals used in the genetics analysis. So luckily, people started to be aware of this issue many years ago. So there are a lot of ongoing efforts to fix this. For example, the NIH TopMed project has 60% non-European subjects out of the phases one to seven. The ongoing NIH Olaf's as project committed to the idea that at least half of the participants should be members of the underrepresented minority population. And our very own NeuroGap and the Pumas project expects to sequence 180,000 subjects from Africa and South American countries for psychiatric research. And I'm going to talk about a little bit more about the UK Bio Bank. But even for the UK Bio Bank is dominantly by the uh, uh, the European ancestry people, there are still 20,000 people of non-European ancestry, which is underutilized at this time. And outside of the North America and the European countries, uh, there are several bio banks driving the data generation. Uh, for example, the bio bank Japan, Taiwan bio bank, and the Korean bio bank. Uh, taken together, they have over 400,000 samples already generated with data available. So with all this, we look forward to an unprecedented amount of data generated from the non-European populations in the next few years. But how about methods? Do we have the tools we need to harness all this data and unleash its, its, unleash its potential for scientific discoveries? 
Well, in the remaining time, I'm going to walk you through three categories of methods, um, namely the, poly, uh, the genetic discovery, the polygenic risk prediction, and the fine mapping. I'll be quick uh, in the first category with uh, a quick review of ongoing studies or published studies and spend a little bit more time in the last two categories uh, that my lab has been quite actively working on uh, recently. So first, methods for genetic discovery. Well, we start to have uh, the non-European data being generated and available. If you review the literature, unfortunately, you still find a lot of the times people chose to remove them in the analysis. And the reasons are often they are quite small comparing to the European sample and they're heterogeneous. So it's very, hard, it's very difficult to model them together with the European data. And you know, sometimes for admixed individuals, there's a added layer of complexity, which is we don't know how to analyze them properly because uh, their genome is a mixture of multiple ancestries. So um, with this, first, I want to highlight uh, the work by my colleague, Alicia Martin. Uh, she led a flagship effort in analyzing all samples, not just the European samples in the UK Dollar Bank. It's called the Pan ukbb project. So a lot of the methods and pipelines she created effectively established how we could analyze a bio bank of diverse ancestries and will be extremely useful for the field. So I encourage you to check out the website after the talk for further details. Another method I want to highlight is a method in preprint led by Patrick Turley. Remember I shared uh, one of the reasons people don't want to include small non-European sample is because of their heterogeneity. So Patrick developed this method that solves the heterogeneity issue by being able to identify and leverage the shared genetic architecture so that you can maximize the power by including this non-European sample, while his method still retains the ability to detect the unique genetic association to each of the ancestries. And again, I encourage you to find out more details uh, from this preprint. Uh, last but not the least, for the genetic discoveries, I want to highlight a method by Elizabeth Arkinson. Um, so again, remember that I told you the individuals of the ethnic genetic background are often not included because they have their genome as a mixture of two or more previously isolated populations. So it has been quite challenging because you have to be able to tell which part of the genome is from which uh, population. It's hard enough to uh, include people of different ancestries, not to mention that people have you know, multiple ancestry in the single genome. So Elizabeth's method effectively uh, identifies and models this, uh, what we call the local ancestry segment, and the condition on that performs the association analysis that to make sure these uh, individual's data are properly analyzed. All right, so let's switch gear a little bit uh, to the polygenic risk prediction. So this is a collective project my lab had with Dr. Tiengert's lab at MGH. So, Polygenic risk prediction refers to using genetic data to predict an individual's risk to disorders. And uh, again, in one of Alicia's earlier paper, there is a, a demonstrated to be a clear job in the accuracy when you use the European data to predict the disease risk for the non-European individuals. So let's see if we set the accuracy for European predict Europe predicting European individuals as one, as a reference, you can see clearly that if you use a European to predict American, South American, East Asia, sorry, American, South Asian, and East Asian, you get an accuracy roughly 50%. And if you do that to the African population, it drops even further to the 25%. Um, so what are the factors driving the job in accuracy? There could be a little different, a little frequency differences across populations. There is LD linkage disequilibrium difference across populations. Ge ge <coughs> excuse me, the genetic effects can be different, meaning some variants may have a larger effect in one population and smaller in the other population. And there could be the environmental factors also influencing the disease risk. But if you look at the list again, you know, uh, I told myself, look, a lot of the factors can actually be modeled mathematically. You can 
reweight the variance based on their relative frequency between European and East Asian population to reflect the difference. You can do the same for the LD pattern. The genetic effect is a little bit tricky. Obviously, you can't, you know, uh, pre you can use a SNP to make the prediction if it has no effect out of the European population. But you know, there have been a lot of existing studies showing that the genetics actually shared quite well uh, across different populations. That means if you have a SNP that is causal for one disorder, it is going to be causal, very likely going to be causal in other populations um, with a correlated effect size. So we can actually leverage this correlation in the effect size to improve our prediction accuracy. So with these observations, we developed the method called PRS-CSX. It effectively combines you know, multiple ancestries. I showed here three, but you can do as many as you wish uh, through a new technique called global shrinkage prior. This prior has the benefit of being extremely flex flexible. We try not to make too much assumption in the genetic architecture across ancestries because we don't know so much about them. So after the combination of all these summary statistics, we uh, create the prediction for each of the ancestry and we linearly combine them to get the best uh, PRS score. We did the simulations and uh, uh, we try to predict, uh, the predict into the African population as an example. And we simulated discovery samples from the African population, the European population, and we try to mimic the real world such that the European population is much larger than the African population. And uh, you know, immediately we can notice that we predict into the East Asian population using a smaller uh, but ancestrally matched data set actually does better than the even bigger European data set, which is what Alicia already told us. Uh, but you can also see that by including all the data both populations, you're actually to, able to do a better job than any of the single population. And of course, uh, comparing with the naive methods, comparing, you know, combining populations, we actually have a better performance if you are able to model these populations in a principled manner. So uh, next, we applied that to the uh, bio banks. We used the UK bio bank, which is predominantly British individuals, and the bio bank Japan, which is uh, individuals of East Asian ancestry. Um, we, you know, again, we replicated what we saw in the simulation, where you know, each if you predict using their single ancestry, you are not doing as good as uh, combining all the ancestries. And to do that in a principled manner always gives you the better performance. So that's paper. this paper has recently been published, and I encourage you to take a closer look uh, if you are interested. So I'm going to dive into the last category of methods I want to talk to you about, which is uh, fine mapping. Again, this is a fantastic collaboration with Tens Lab. So what is fine mapping? So in a nutshell, fine mapping helps you to identify the causal variant from this complex uh, GWAS association figure. So uh, this is what you typically see from your GWAS analysis. It's a you know, region of variance with significance. And this is what you don't see, but you want to know that it's a causal variance you know, underlying this region, generating the data you see in panel B. So fine mapping basically helps you to get from panel B to panel A. Sometimes you get lucky. Uh, look at the blue dot here, you're able to get the exact causal variant with 100% confidence. But sometimes, or more, you know, more often, you don't, you, you're not that lucky. You get a you know, credible set with a few variants. You don't know which of them are exactly the causal variant, but you do know the probability for them to be causal. For example, the best one has uh, like 40% probability, and the next best one has 20% probability. So this is a quick review of fine mapping. Uh, talking about fine mapping, um, my colleague Hillary did a great job uh, in doing fine mapping in multiple ancestries, including the British ancestry from UK Bao Bank, Finnish ancestry from Finjian, and the Japanese ancestry from Bao Bank Japan. So what she did was uh, she performed high quality fine mapping in each of the Bao Banks and focused the discussion on the findings that are shared across Bao Banks and have good confidence. Um, but here I'm thinking, can we do a little bit better by 
combining all the bio banks rather than doing them separately. And I do this because we have observed several examples like this, which is uh, for each of the individual bio banks, we really don't see a strong enough evidence to point us to the causal variant. Uh, this is a result you'll see for the European, African, and East Asian bio banks. And if you're familiar with GWAS, you know we usually treat uh, eight here as you know genome-wide significant, and having a five to four here isn't really something impressive. But because the results are converging across all the bio banks, if you do them together, you can actually identify the causal variant. So with this idea, we developed a method combining results across the bio banks, and in comparison. Uh, you know, in the past, people have been doing that across individual bio banks and doing the combination post hoc after you have the credible set from each of the individual bio banks. So we applied our method to the UK bio bank and Taiwan bio bank. Taiwan bio bank is um, around 100,000 individuals of the East Asian ancestry. The, uh, the green bar here shows you the findings we made using the combined method and the other bars here shows you the findings we made uh, if we do that separately. So we do see a increase in number of you know, loci we are able to map to over 95% confidence. However, uh, it's a little bit uh, disappointing that you know, the increase, increase increment is roughly 10 to 15%. It's not as big as we, as we wished for. Um, so looking into the details, we do see that all the individual you know, findings made in single bio bank are also found in our method. So that means we can replicate almost 100% of the findings in the single bio bank finding. Um, although, you know, with one exception, which is the one shown here, we looked into the original data is a uh, complex indel insertion deletion, and it's an imputed indel. So we feel there could be a genotyping error uh, leading to the imputation problem for this endow, which we are looking further into. Um, but in addition, you know, we are able to identify additional causal variants through the combination of the multiple bio banks. All right. Um, I hope I have convinced you that the bias in genetic data towards the European population really hurts the equality and the science. And I have shared with you a couple inclusive methods that could unleash the potential of the non-European data, including the association analysis, polygenic risk prediction, and the fine mapping. And I do want to remind everyone that you know there are so many unsolved challenges, and I encourage everyone of you to engage these challenges. For example, we really lack the methods to analyze the admixed individuals, such as we don't have the fine mapping method for them, we don't have the PRS method for them. And also, the field haven't really seen any great or you know powerful enough uh, environmental contribution studies, which I think you know we really should be focusing on as well. So I want to uh, thank my lab for doing a fantastic job to power all the great analysis and the method development, and also my colleagues for creating the environment for me to do this. And thank you very much.